being resourceful with some like like the dam or with like binder how do you quantify those hours and you want to make sure you're working with communicating that consistently because people forget that when a tool works so good for you after a while you forget that how painful it was before and that's where you, you it's important to remind people like no no you know that's great don't be cut my budget on certain things because this is saving everyone time and stress and reality saves us money in the long term, even though it seems like, well, everything's going great now. We don't need this anymore. Welcome to the Digital Advantage by Binder, a show by marketers for marketers who want to create engaging content experiences to differentiate their brand from the competition. Let's jump right in. Hello and welcome back to the Digital Advantage. My name is Donald O'Marron, Director of Demand Center here at Binder. And uh, this is a show yeah, where we like to take you through what's happening in MarTech and content experiences and bringing interesting guests to you to be able to guide you through some of the challenges that you might be having across those things as well. I have a really interesting guest for you today. Before we jump into that, be sure if you're joining us for the first time to subscribe like ask a few questions if anything seems interesting to you piques your interest we'll ask those later in, in later episodes so today we're going to be talking around martech primarily how it can help you achieve your strategic initiatives how to select it how to think about your martech stack and of course the challenges of managing the content and getting your story across through that martech stack as well so to do that i'm joined by a really interesting guest we've chatted before and he's got not only uh, an incredible perspective on those topics, but also a really interesting backstory. And I maintain all the most interesting people we talk to and all the most interesting marketers in particular don't have sort of a straightforward linear story and have sort of a, a story that's taken them multiple different directions. So without further ado, let me introduce our guest today. His name is Greg Lambert, VP of MarTech at Mir. Greg, welcome. Ah, uh, Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, I've teased it there. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? and your career so far, and then a little bit about Mayor for people that don't know. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of my journey, yeah, it's it's definitely unconventional. I've kind of fell into marketing like a lot of marketers have done. Before in the past, I was a Peace Corps volunteer down in Nicaragua, working with coffee farmers, at-risk uh, youth groups, and women's groups. And then you know, where I kind of got dabbled a little bit in marketing, especially with creating new products. But you know, after hitchhiking back to the U.S. for like through Central America for, for numerous months, I got back to the States and just kind of realized I wanted to you know, do something different. So even though I had worked in the coffee industry for about 10 years, the uh, you know, barista, corporate trainer, I eventually uh, decided to, to go to grad school at Thunderbird, you know, down in Arizona and Switzerland. Then after that, I did some consulting in the Netherlands. I lived in Italy for a while, but I actually ended up going back to Nicaragua and opening up a beef jerky company with a buddy of mine. And I, uh, you know, Built it brick by brick. We were expanding it throughout Central America until kind of the political situation in Nicaragua kind of forced us to close it down. And then from there, I you know did some consulting in Mexico before I took it, really got a more of a marketing marketing job as a brand manager for Miller Coors out in Micronesia. So you know, Guam, Saipan, Palau, Tinian, all the islands out there uh, in charge of it for three years. And then moved to Singapore, did some work there, digital marketing for wine distributor before landing at actually more of the traditional Nestle type of role. So I was doing Hispanic marketing at Nestle for numerous years, loved it, you know, really targeting U.S. Hispanic markets and general market with Hispanic brands. And then I moved back into kind of the coffee industry with Keep Cup, which is a, actually a competitor of me right now. And then really decided to go B2B focus and went to an energy services company called NACE Corporation, largest third-party contractor for power plants in the U.S. And just really dove into B2B, marketing technology, CRM, rebuilding all those and then kind of decided wanted to go back to more CPG style. And that's how I'm now at Mir, where I'm vice president of marketing technology. I handle all the e-commerce for B2B, D2C, Amazon, as well as the B2B marketing for emails, managing the CRM and, and also the ad buy for both B2B and D2C. And then you have not for Mir. Mir is it's a premium lifestyle brand that's really focused on design, generosity, and responsibility. You'll see us in high-end clients like Blue Bottle Coffee, Stumptown Coffee, Patagonia. If you're driving a Rivian, most likely you have a, one of our products in there to sort of partner with Rivian or go to a Coldplay concert. So we're really focused on tastemakers and really that premium branding. 
I, I'm just getting my head around that that uh, <laughs> career thus far, right? I've crossed Europe and Central America and Southeast Asia and the Pacific as well. I can't imagine that you, you know, <laughs> like I say, probably what's led you to, you know, to where you are now is those multiple perspectives you've picked up as well. And I wonder maybe, is there something that attracts you to a company like Mir and that social responsibility sort of side of it? Having yeah, seen I, so much of the world and travel so much? Yeah, I, for me, it, it was really kind of going back to my roots of, you know, working in coffee shops, working in the coffee industry, but also, you know, as a Peace Corps volunteer, you're always looking at, you know, how can you improve the world? So that's one thing that Mir is, it's pretty central to how we do, how we run the business, who we are, and even as uh, employees, just how we kind of look at things. And uh, we try to use that lens to try to make sure we're, we're focusing on improving the world and doing, doing as best we can. And we'll get into your, the content that Mir produces later, right? Some of the video stuff as well, mm -hmm. but it is, you know, that clearly comes through in the marketing, right? Side of it, certainly, or if you and probably more content than marketing, right? So long form videos. I was watching one recently about a, a guy in them um, mountains in Japan. Was it really? Mm -hmm. He runs yes. like a, yeah, sort of. He, he, he described him as almost the mayor of the town <laughs> in that he has, you know, how he sort of operates around it and everything. And I was, yeah, really just uh, incredibly striking sort of visuals and storytelling through that as well. So clearly, you know, if, there's a there's a clear purpose through the company as well. So tell me then, Mir. What's going on right now? What are, what are your sort of strategic initiatives? How is the business from, you know, when you joined? Has it changed it, it changed in any way? What's the perspective at the moment? I think probably the biggest change in the probably the last year and a half really has been I mean, B2B is actually majority of our business, but we had we've been focusing more on D2C storytelling, D2C focus and communications. Even the the assets we were building were more focused for D2C. And then now that we're really pivoting and refocusing back onto B2B in terms of ads, in terms of our communications, our materials. You know, our materials are more of like partnership-based materials, less less of just like, oh, this is our new product. It's more about here's our partner, here's our, you know, here's the taste maker that we that we're affiliated with that is aligned with what, what we believe in. So this big, big change is just B2B and B2C, but you've you know, the lifestyle brand runs across both those, but at the same time, do you, you know, there's a multi-brand, multi-product, multi-region strategies at play as well? Yeah, I, for especially like multi-product, since we have a lot of products that is very coffee focused, so we know that, you know, coffee shops and, the, and kitchenware, those type of things, we have those products, we have a, you know, sales team and a focus of a collateral just for that. But then we also have very big hydration focus where, as you see, your competitors like Yeti and Stanley are, are heavy in. But probably about 40% of our business is actually in Asia. We're actually fairly big in Japan, Korea, uh, Indonesia, and China. So it's one of the things that we're, we have a focus on growing, Asia, continuing to grow Asia, but also growing more internationally as well as just solidifying things in our domestic you know, neighborhood here in the U.S. You even got dog bowls and pet accessories and such at, uh, at that point. So my dog has been promised a bowl, so I have to get around to that at some stage. I'll, they look like I'll, really I'll find a way to get one to you out there and, and the other ones. Yeah, but the, awesome. same thing with our that. kitchenware where, you know, we're not just cups and, and bottles. Yeah. We're also uh, moving into like soft goods, like in terms of apparel and uh, hat, headwear yes. to really become like a one-stop shop, you know, for our partners. But then, then you also have the coffee carafes. So if you want high-end coffee or mocha pots, same thing. We, we build, uh, you know, very sleek, nice design, very design forward products that you can either brand or just use in your home. You know, you, you brought them up there. So let's, let's just dive right in. Yeti, Stanley, these are, you know, competitors, clearly big products. Stanley are one of the hottest brands in the world right now. How, how are like, how are you differentiating? How are you competing? What role does content play? How are you as a VP of MarTech looking at that and saying, this is how our MarTech is going to set us up to deliver that as well. Well, I think, uh, you know, as, as someone like Stanley, you know, Stanley's really focused on the, you know, large consumer, especially the you know, female consumer. For us, we're really focused on, you know, who are some tastemakers, who are some partners, more corporate partners that we can work with to help them tell their story on our vessels. It's not just putting a lo slapping a logo on our products. If you see a lot of our stuff, it's a lot of, design, a lot of thoughts gone into it to, to build out something that 
is that people want to buy, want to share, want to have on their on their desk as well as you know walkabouts. So I think really a lot of it comes down to just the, the partnerships that we're focused on is is significantly different than say you know Stanley and and Yeti are. Yeti's very focused on outdoors, hunting, fishing, industrial. You know really that that type of that type of audience. For us, it's more about tastemakers and just having a, a beautiful design and knowing that what we're what we're doing and what you're buying when you buy our product is you know try and be as responsible as possible as well as just aesthetically beautiful so then i mean the classic marketing things segmenting positioning having your go-to-market strategy right the b2b and the b2c split finding the right kind of partners who are willing to work with you and and buy into that story all set up there but again Okay, on the B two B side, that's one thing. On the B uh, D two C, you've got these multiple sort of businesses working as well, and you have to consistently tell that story. So, that's the bit that needs to cut through still, right? Like that that experience, that storytelling. Yeah, and uh, a lot of it is you know, we've kind of rebuilt the teams over the last couple of years to to focus on themes, focus more, you know, take our assets, and let's be more more thought more thoughtful about it. Instead of ad hoc, how can we plan for a longer term? You know, we're still a small business. You know, we're about 60, yeah. 65 employees. So we're still fairly small uh, and scrappy in many ways. But at the same time, as we kind of get more resourceful and strategic, how can we plan, plan out not just our assets, but also our marketing tech stack to support those assets and support the business needs of the future. So we're able to scale faster and, and just be a little more streamlined. So we're not just constantly putting out fires. It's, it's always amazing to hear somebody, you know, out of business, exactly, not firefighting, being like, well, if we want to be this company in three years' time, yeah, let's say, right, or five years' time, what are the decisions we need to make today while we're still also, you know, doing the most important, urgent stuff? So you said it there, right? Like, I mean, that is a, let's dive into that. What, how do you, that's a digital transformation project that you're talking about, right? Like, and maybe... So how, what is your role in that digital transformation process and the role more broadly of the MarTech stack in delivering upon that promise? Yeah. So in terms of the, in terms of the role itself, I mean, that's, that's kind of my, I originally started off as a VP of digital where you know, I was really focused on, on D2C, the e rebuilding the website, you know, getting that to where it's, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty broken site. We rebuilt it, you know, my team, we did it internally. So it's now streamlined. It's beautiful. But we also have to look at, well, what about the, you know, in terms of communications, emails, SMS, assets, just really having assets available to everyone at a, that's easy to find and not wasting time. So that's where, you know, one of the first things I, I came on board was we were using Google Drive. And, you know, Google Drive is great for work in progress documents. But when you have final documents, when you're going folder within folder within folder trying to find something, it's a nightmare. And I would... I remember I spent about an hour and a half one time trying to find photos of the co-founders and just going through folder, book on folder. And it was like a Saturday afternoon. I spent an hour and a half, couldn't find anything. That's why I realized- You don't, you don't enjoy that. No, yeah, this, that wasn't like, enjoyable. This, I, I like, could not be the only person going through this pain. So yeah, right. really just you know, talk to the teams, talk, especially the creative team, and found out like we need to have a, we need to really have a, a proper you know, dam, proper way. Uh, that's where Binder came in. Yeah, it's not- mm. Granted, this, does, this shouldn't be like a plug for Binder, but really Binder's helped us streamline. It's helped us save money because of hours spent trying to find assets, being able to share with our distributors internationally, share it with our partners, uh, with our agencies, instead of having to create a whole new Google Drive that, that's focused for externals. So you're copying one file to another. We're able just to share it. And that's that helps streamline hours upon hours of work and save just thousands of dollars of manpower hours mm. just to just to get this, just to, just in that tool alone. Then we looked at, okay, what about the CRM? And no one was really using a CRM at the time. So we rebuilt the CRM, got the whole sales team. You know, it's been about a year now. We have the whole sales team working within a CRM system. So there's communication. We see activity. If someone's on vacation or PTO, someone else is able to pick up, right? pick up the ball and move forward with, you know, with, with, the, with the work and make sure it integrates again with our ERP, all our other systems too. So as well as uh, Shopify, any, any e-commerce platforms. So there's, it's, when you look at, when you look at marketing technology and growing that and building that and looking at, you have to look at at least in three years lenses where what's something that'll last you for three years where you're not going to have to onboard something every year or change it out. 
And you may take a little extra investment, may take a little more power and people power to really just build it out, but it's worth it. Yeah. Are integrations important for you in that? Integrations are, yeah, integrations are key. One thing we, we, we typically struggle with is API integrations with our ERP. It's something that you have to invest in and a lot of people may not think about the money for that. They may think, oh, I have this great tool. When you, and then when you start getting down the road of setting up onboarding, then you realize you have to spend also additional money to build an API for it and, and ensure that that API will work. If it doesn't work, maybe that tool will, will work for you and you have to find something else. So that's integration is key. It can actually break a whole project. Just not being able to integrate with your ERP or CRM, you're kind of dead in the water. I, I couldn't agree more. It's like, the, often have this thing particularly, okay, we're coming from the content side. Can we, you know, we still, people are still sort of downloading and uploading stuff from certain systems, you know, and obviously that's something we're trying to break down. But I always think about like, I come from the marketing automation side of business, right? So I think it's be bizarre if we were to have to download some thing from the data layer, from the customer data layer, right? To upload that into another system, they just sync with each other, right? And I, and that's allows those systems to you know, work in that regard. And that's the foundational promise. Yet somehow with content in particular, we still accept that, you know, that that should be the norm. We should download and send it by email or something like that, as opposed to, you know, sharing collections or whatever you described there is, is, you know, that being the norm. So tell me about this. When we, we chat chat before and I was um, interested in this idea of how you go about thinking about the tech stack. Maybe you could just solidify. I think you said it there, but you mentioned a lot of the toolings, but you had this sort of three stage process for mm. how to how you would think about your tech stack could you take us through that yeah absolutely I think so I mean, when you're a startup yeah you're looking there's you're up your there's three phases there's scrappy there's a forceful and they're strategic i scrappy is like you're a startup you're putting out fires all the time your tech stack is a house of cards ready to fall and collapse at any moment i mean it's it, you're using uh, you know, cheap if not free tools and constantly hacking them to figure out a band-aid to make it work and I kind of see that that's you know, at the very beginning, it's, it's fun, you're, it's energetic, but it's also tiring. And you have to kind of look at, well, what's the long-term plan? And that's when you start looking at being more resourceful and you kind of building, the, you're building bricks, you're laying bricks down, trying to say, okay, here's a, here's one solution. Here's a damn solution. Okay. Here's a ERP solution uh, and a CRM solution. Start look, start going through those, building out, you know, longer term tools that will work, but also you're hiring you're hiring less, you're hiring more experienced people as well when you're doing this, because you need to also find out like, well, who's going to need an admin? Is this, does this system require an admin, multiple admins, whose budget is it under? So you're having to be a little more be budget savvy and you can spend a little bit more than when you're in a scrappy phase, but you're still, you're mm -hmm. still fairly on a, a tight budget. The strategic phase is when you're looking at the long term. Okay. We're going to, we're investing in this ERP. It's going to lot. It's going to be you know, our our bread and butter. It's going to be our source of truth for everything, for inventory, for pricing, for sales. And it's going to integrate with everything else. We know like this is our base tool. Mm -hmm. Same thing with that, like a CRM. Uh, you really have to kind of dive in, and and really own it. Because if you're moving from, like say Salesforce to Microsoft Dynamics 365, or mm -hmm. to from Salesforce to even HubSpot. It's training that's involved, offboarding and onboarding, uh, and just automations that you're constantly having to tweak and figure out. It takes a while to, to get it going. By how I believe it, though, it's not really just those separate three stages. Even when you're strategic, you're still using cheap, free tools, like as an app on Shopify to, to do a gift with purchase or you know, try, try to find other, you know, being resourceful on some other tools that... Yeah, you, know, you could use this tester. We know it's going to last like two or three years before you move on to something else, but it's it's something that uh, you're planning ahead for. Or even change, you know, what you use this solution for at different stages as well. You're right. I, I'm having, uh, I'm about to break out and sweat here at the thought of changing our CRM at this <laughs> stage. You know what I mean? Like we're just not going to do that. But absolutely, like there's a certain number of tools that we're constantly assessing and constantly looking at and saying, is that... Is that right for us? Are you doing that at all? Are you like looking at those scrappy and resourceful ones, probably in particular, and assessing yeah. uh, how they're contributing to your business and, and how are you going about that? 
A lot of numbers. You got to have, I, when you bring on these tools, you have to find a way to, to quantify what's the performance, what's the ROI on it. So, you know, if you're finding, if you're looking for you know, a scrappy gift with purchase app to add on to your Shopify store, there's tons of them out there. But what is there one that gives you a dashboard that helps you understand how it's performing? Yeah, you may find one that's cheaper, but if you spend 10 bucks more and you get one that gives you a dashboard, helps, helps you understand the performance metrics that you can pull into a report and present to the executive leadership team. That makes a difference. Same thing with being resourceful with some like, like a dam or with like binder, you know, how, how do you quantify those hours? And you want to make sure you're working with your working with communicating that consistently because people forget that when a tool works so good for you after a while, you forget that how painful it was before. And that's where you, you it's important to remind people like, no, no, you're, you know, that's great. Don't, don't be cutting my budget on certain things because this is saving everyone time and stress and, mm. and, and reality saves us money in the long term. even though it seems like, well, everything's going great now. We don't need this anymore. Yeah. yeah. That, that must be it. I, I'd imagine you might wake up in the middle of the night, <laughs> the thought night after a nightmare of somebody saying that to you. Like, but again, you do, yeah, you'd probably have to defend these things as well as, you know, prove the value of them consistently. And I think that is legitimately fine, particularly in, you know, current economy. And, you know, I'm sure MarTech budgets can look yeah. sort of, or, or the cost of something on paper can seem astounding and, sh you know, shock people out of their shoes. But ultimately, the value it drives, uh, you know, and again, probably just, bring it back to binder you've expressed there previously some of the value that that brings in terms of yes efficiencies and hours saved but also i, I assume like capacity to deliver that experience yeah. that you're trying to do as well make that sort of more consistent yeah and also you really have to work with your finance team i mean uh, yeah. a lot of people forget that you know, your finance team is actually your best friend when you're in marketing because they're the ones that can lock the budget for you and and if you're working with them directly and closely to figure out okay What's the story I need to tell the executive leadership team to get this approved? You know, what's the, you know, what's the cost? Is there a capex involved that, you know, you can have spread out the cost for multiple years. So then you're, so it doesn't, doesn't seem like a big swallow at first. What's the, is there budget for the next few years for us? So again, like you may be able to set up something that you'll have your tech budget, but when you add it on a new tool, what's the, what's the incremental years of, of cost that's going to be? And is that budgeted for, for the next year's budget? bringing on the agency to help you onboard. Is, are you already incorporating that into the budget or is that going to be a surprise that you're going to lay on the finance team? Again, you want to be forefront with the, with the finance team to make sure that they, they're helping you tell the story and providing even additional numbers and backup to, to help you. So, so it helps you sell it in. Are you like, so the finance team at most companies, yes, there's an AP side of it, but quite often they're planning as well, right? And they're saying, yeah. this is what the next however long the business, you know, whatever their sort of view of the length, the, the length of the future of the business that they're looking at one year, five years, whatever it is, are you pitching technology to help them achieve those sort of financial goals as well? Like, is that is not just a marketing growth thing, but like a, hey, here's how we can uh, achieve your financial goals as well in order to get that over the line? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and because like you said, it's not just, it's not just AP and AR, it's also forecasting. Forecasting is key. Especially when you're a small company, it's it's kind of forecasting is put upon heavily on the shoulders of finance and accounting to to kind of lead the charge and get the sales team as well as even me because I you know I do the PL for the different e-commerce channels, so being able to provide those those forecasts and then like I said, plan as a, is there if we need to scale out and build out these new channels, what are the softwares and tools that are going to help support that and being part of that where you're investing in it. I'm going to jump around here a little bit. Because we, I, I, we have a question from a previous episode that we, I wanted to bring to you at the end, but we've just talked about it now here, right? So maybe you could break it down for us, just you know, super simple terms. What is it that goes into a compelling business case when you're buying Martech, you're proposing it to you know those those financial teams, senior financial people, and the executive team as well? In your experience. For me, I think it, you kind of you have to tell a story. You first have to say, okay, this is the issue. Our current tools or no tools that you may not have, that's causing this much extra work and it's causing this much. It's limiting us based on what we want to do for sales. 
So really kind of build up that case of like, wait, what's the, what's the issue we currently have? And break that down to where everyone's in agreement. Like, yes, this is an issue. This is where we understand it. That's when you, then you ideally should always at least do like look at three different options for a solution. So instead of just saying, okay, here's my recommendation. Here's the solution. It's like, no, you should always say, okay, I, I evaluated. I evaluated this vendor versus this vendor. Yeah, this vendor I thought was great. And I'm sure you heard a lot about it, but you know what? Will that vendor be around in three years? Who knows? Yeah, it's, it, may, sure. it, it may be a hot topic, but will they be around? So again, you have to look at, you have to also plan for the future when you do this. So it's not like a year later that vendor collapses and you have egg in your face. And then you're having to scrap, be scrapping, find a whole new solution and restart the whole project again. The, then you run, so that at, once you be, find that recommendation, that final solution, then you're looking at, Okay, here's my recommendation. Here's the the tool. Here's the cost of it. Here's how we can. Here's the onboarding cost of it. Here's the long term cost. Mm-hmm. Here's how many admins, if if at all, will be needed for it. Maybe it doesn't need an admin, and you're. It's like, you know what? My team can already take on you know some of this work, so we're not needing additional headcount for this for now or the future, you know, for this tool. So that's another key thing is always think about headcount because that's going to be in the the top. That's when your special you know, your si- small company like us. You know, adding a, adding an additional person, you know, to I mean, you're like 65 people and making it to 70 people. That's that's a significant cost and to a, to a small company. Then looking at you know working with with finance to show the the numbers in terms of okay, over a three year period, this is what the cost of it's going to be. Don't just look at like oh, initial cost and one year cost. Look at it at least for three to five years what this tool is because you want to be providing a solution that is long term, not just a, a band aid. That's gonna you know just break because you change something else on your system somewhere else, and then you know also be open to constructive feedback. You're gonna have the executive leadership team asking you questions. Know your numbers. That's a lot of things I always tell you know, tell my team and tell other people is know your numbers. One thing I learned at Nestle was know every number you can think of. Like you know think ahead of what they may ask about for costs, for the you know, number of assets that may be needed to use, do this, how many people, what's the timeline? Is this the right time? That's another thing you have to look at. Do you want to be starting a new project in Q4 where everyone's crazy, busy selling? You know, if your sure. sales cycle is, if your calendar year sales cycle and Q4 is the busiest time of year, you probably don't want to be bringing on a new tool or and asking people time to be able to bring on a new tool when everyone's just already crazy busy. No, one, no one's going to appreciate sure. that. I can tell you from experience that's uh, not appreciated. But you know, you mentioned that thing there about you know competitive or getting Martech and you know making selection with companies that will be around for the long run. You know, we're in a particularly turbulent period in terms of tech right now. A lot of a phrase I heard the other day, you know, merge acquisitions kind of thing. Like companies strategically are looking around saying growth isn't what it was, and we'll you know we'll merge together as a strategic initiative. That's going to impact customers. You know what I mean? If that isn't a totally neat process or if you know that's that has a a downstream impact so for sure you want to be looking certainly with something that we are looking for consistently you know my limited role on the martech acquisition side here at finder is that exact thing like is this somebody can grow with i've made that same decision uh, that you've described as well almost you know strategic is this somebody can go with for a year right uh, until we're ready for the next thing and it never works out well either right if you know what you want you're still just go for that Exactly. It's a, it's a, you know, you're putting the, you know, it's just a bit of a patch on it. So look, I think you and I could probably talk a little bit more about acquiring MarTech and the ins and outs and how we assess and everything. And I would love to do that. I think probably coming up on time here now a little bit, maybe I could just ask you what's sort of, what's sort of next from here? What are you, what are you, you know, planning to do, hoping to do? What could we see come out of your side of the world in the next, in the year, in the next year? Yeah, so, uh, something that my team and I are working on right now that we're excited about is that it's it's a project that's been we've been postponing for the last couple of years, but we're now at the point it's like no, we're doing this, and it's mm-hmm. we're rebuilding the loyalty program. Like on our pro- on our products, when you there's a code that you can put into the computer, you know, it's it was supposed to tell you before when we were doing a product project where you know we would invest, you buy a product and that would go to a specific nonprofit or project. Because we, we, you know, like I said, we're very focused on generosity. We give a you know, percentage of top line revenue to nonprofits, but we're no longer project, product to project. We're now focused on, okay, after COVID, we realized you could be pigeonhole money. You'd end up pigeonhole money into an area for a nonprofit that they can't use, can't tap. 
So how do we just kind of give money to them and let them use it the way they need to? So there's this code on the bottom of all of our products where you scan it and it'll take you to a gift code page and you put that, that code in. It's a horrible experience right now. It's just that it doesn't match what we do. And so instead we're actually rebuilding it internally. Yeah. So we're not, you know, our teams learn, you know, different things in React and different things using Sanity and Airtable to build out a new tool that when you put in your information, we're going to show you the transparent journey of that product. We're going to show you where the, the recycled stainless steel comes from, as well as the other 10% of stainless steel, as well as the recycled plastic that's used in the products to the factory. And then from the factory to uh, the distrib distribution center, wherever you are around the world. And then ideally close to where you are you know, using, uh, you know, using technology to find like close to where you are. We don't want to be showing you specifically your house, but again, try and sure. show that carbon footprint all the way down to be as transparent as possible. So you understand where the products are coming from. And then on addition, in addition to that, helping you understand more about, you know, having a place where if you're interested in the coffee products or you're interested in water charities, having the blog content and they're also easily accessible based on what you like and want to see. So for us, that, that's for my team. Oh, that's okay. something that works for. That is, it does sound exciting. Like we heard in your voice there as well. I'm sort of, you know, there's elements of that. Like you're obviously talking personalization, right? A uh, huge amount of personalization as well as it being tied to sort of that promise. That and you're then uh, you know, uh, building out really a loyalty program. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then again, back into that sort of bifurcated business that you have now as well, right? The B2B and the B2C side as well. And switching hats all the time. I don't envy you. I imagine content has a big part to play in that as well as, you know, delivering that personalized and sort of rich experience to those most loyal customers as well, right? Yeah. Well, but we're very fortunate. We have the content. We just have in the past been very good at telling the content and show and sharing right. the content. Like we're, we do some great things, but we're, we haven't done the best job in the past of telling people about it. They yeah, are impact report right. that we did last year actually was pretty, really shows out a little more and as, especially the transparency as much as possible, but I think we can always do better. It's something that we're, we're always, we're never, we're never going to rest on our laurels. We'll always want to find ways to do better. Like we're moving all of our products to 90% recycled stainless steel. It's, it's going to take time to do it, but right. we're already doing it with some of our products and just moving it to where it's not hundred percent raw material. It's actually 90%. It's 90% uh, recycled. Yeah. Well, I mean, you mentioned it there, the distribution distribution side of creating content that is so critical it has to be part of a strategy you know what i mean i think it's definitely something that i'm always learning and and trying to develop here as well right like as in not just creating something brilliant but where is this going to go how is it going to live through everything we do to the specific audience that we needed to reach for the whole year right i think is pretty critical so wishing you all the best with that <laughs> and i'm rooting for you as well and i will hope to get my hands on some of the the mirror stuff at some stage because uh, it's really beautiful products and a uh, wonderful range as well. And uh, Greg, you've been absolute, absolutely brilliant. So, so generous to come and share with us all those particular, you know, ways of thinking that you have, all those rubrics, etc. that scrappy, resourceful, strategic is one that I'm going to take away and continue to sort of, you know, how encourage my team to think about where, where things are replacing sort of or alongside that crawl walk run sort of thing that we've used in the past this is a bit more like how can we get something done today while and, sim and plan for the future as well right not everything has to be 10 out of 10 absolutely all the time. we can yeah you know, as long as we're keeping moving yeah that's what i'm taking from it so i really appreciate uh, you joining us and uh, yeah we'll we'll look forward to seeing you again soon for everybody watching here today do go check out mirror.com that's m-i-i-r.com for some of their amazing products across you know your drinkware and your apparel and your apparel and the rest as well. check out some of the excellent videos on youtube that tells the story of her influence across the world with their customers and partners as well yeah do join us back here if you haven't so far do subscribe do comment in any questions you have any feedback for me and the whole team here we uh, always love to hear it uh, but for now thank you very much for joining us Thanks for listening to this episode of The Digital Advantage, brought to you by Binder, the leading digital asset management platform. Binder helps you conquer the chaos of growing content, touch points, and relationships. If you found this episode inspiring, you'll love our additional content on our social channels, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. 